Greetings adventurers, my name is Kramer, and you know we had to do it. First we had top 10 mistakes for fantasy medieval costumes, and now we have my top 10 tips. These are things that, in my opinion, you should do. But first we have to address the elephant in the room, which is Kramer, you're not wearing green. What happened? You barely look like yourself. Well, there is a very specific reason for that. A couple of them, actually. The first one is that I'm wearing what I'm wearing today to illustrate some points later down in the video to use as examples. I won't be giving a visual example for everything, and th this could probably be considered bonus tip. Tip number zero is that I have a lot of stuff and I can't wear all of it all of the time. Um, and that might be the case for you as well. And it doesn't really matter how many cool things you've either made or bought or, or been given as a gift, sometimes you can't put everything on or it's just gonna look ridiculous. I like to do a lot of experimenting. I like to see what new uh, costume setups I can come up with. So this is one that I'm working on right now. You can go ahead and comment below what you think this character might turn into. I'm very curious to see what people have to say, but we'll get right into it now with tip number one, which is to find garments that have detachable sleeves. Especially when we're talking about outer garments like coats or surcoats or even over tunics or things like gambesons. Having garments with detachable sleeves is a very versatile thing to add to your kit. It means that you'll be more comfortable um, in different climates and you can uh, adjust based on your body temperature without having to ruin the overall silhouette or look of your character uh, by taking off an entire piece. Having detachable sleeves is also kind of a two-in-one because it means that you can create multiple different looks with the exact same piece. It just looks different every time. You get a lot more mileage that way. Detachable sleeves are just a really functional design element to add to your garb and with a little bit of ingenuity know-how you can even take garments that don't originally have detachable sleeves and easily modify them into ones that do. You just need a seam ripper, a couple grommets. In fact, that might be a really good video to do on the channel. Go ahead and let me know what you think. Tip number two is to get a brooch. These should probably be one of the first investments you make in terms of jewelry or ornaments for your garb. These are super versatile. Now, they also have different purposes. A very large brooch is meant to hold back a garment that is also very large and also very heavy. So like a big cloak is gonna need something this big in order to properly hold it back or it's just gonna flop all over the place. A very small brooch can be used on the front of your hood. You can pin it to your uh, tunic to keep the flap from coming up into your face if it's windy. When I bought my first brooch, I got one that was like this. Uh, and I actually sent it back because I didn't want one that was so big. I was thinking, oh, well, the, the pin on this is huge. I don't want it to poke a huge hole in my cloak and ruin it. Um, but now I've since come to realize that that is a very uh, realistic thing. That is what would happen to cloaks in the time period. So in a sense, it, it's very much a sort of authentic weathering. If you get one that's themed, it can be a great way to show off something about your character, whether that be your status, or some sort of animal motif that relates to your persona. They can pin back scarves, you can wear them in the modern day uh, and get compliments from your coworkers. Brooches also have a number of uses aside from holding back garments. If you have one that's like this, that's nice and sturdy with a, with a nice thick pin, you can use that as an awl. Uh, if you're crafting or doing repairs on your kit, you can also use the ring itself to create a makeshift tripod while you're camping. A brooch is a very cheap and functional investment and it is a great way to add some decoration and flair to your garb. Tip number three is to use 100% natural fibers in the material of your garb, whether you're making something or purchasing 100% natural materials. And very importantly, to research those materials to make sure that they are right for the climate that you are actually going to be wearing your garb in. If you are doing historical reenactment, then you really need to do that research to know what was available in your culture, in your area, in your time period uh, for what it is that you are interpreting. And if we're talking about medieval Europe, then generally that's going to be wool, linen, silk, cotton, pretty much in that order from the most available to least available. So my advice is to actually research what was historically worn in the area that you live and then try to find medieval styled garments made out of those materials. Because if they were used historically where you live, then theoretically they should function for the climate that you're living in. It's no good wearing something accurate to a completely different climate than the one that you reside in unless you absolutely have to. Because even if it is accurate and you want to feel how they would have felt in their time period in order to be more immersive, it's not going to function accurately the same way that it would have for them because you don't live in the same place. Tip number four is to size up your outer layers. Things like gambesons, coats, tabards, all of those need 
to accommodate the layers that you're going to be wearing underneath. And the last thing that you want to do is buy everything at the same size and then put everything on and not be able to move or look like a sausage. And given that we prize functionality here on the channel, I'm gonna go ahead and make the assertion that a garment that is slightly too big is going to be better than a garment that is slightly too small simply because of mobility. Tip number five is to upcycle old pieces of your kit. Just because something is old or doesn't fit the same way anymore doesn't mean that it isn't still useful. And for my example for this, the tunic that I'm wearing right now was not made to be worn this way. This was made for me when I was a very small child. It is supposed to be a wizard robe. It was supposed to go down to the floor and these sleeves are not supposed to be this length. They're supposed to cover my whole arm. And yet even though I'm much bigger now, it creates a completely different look. Not the same one it was intended to, but a new one. And luckily the body of what is now a tunic and used to be a robe is actually so large that it can size up and accommodate all of the layers underneath. You can take an old cloak and turn it into a cowl. You can take an old tunic and cut it into strips for lead wraps, or you can make pouches or bags. It's a totally free resource. You don't lose anything if you make a mistake because it wasn't doing anything for you anyway. And it's also a great way to practice a new skill. Another great way to practice a new skill is today's video sponsor, Skillshare. I am constantly on the search for new skills to learn in order to add to my video making arsenal. Now I'm only one man, but I want to have a production style that makes it seem like I have a whole team behind me. And there was an absolute lot to cover, but that's why I really appreciate the structure of Skillshare because a good teacher with a well thought out lesson plan will tell you everything that you need to know and answer questions that you didn't even know you had before you've even thought to ask them so that you can spend your time just learning rather than figuring out what it is that you need to learn in the first place. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. The first 1,000 people to use my special link in the description will get one month free so you can explore classes on filmmaking, character illustration, creative writing. The search for knowledge is endless. So check out Skillshare with the link below in the description and a huge thank you to them for sponsoring this video. Man, that was a clean transition, but you know what isn't clean is you after you've been camping outside for five days straight. So tip number six is how to deal with the smell of smoke in your costume. If your garment is going to be damaged or shrink if you put it into a washing machine, then that poses some problems when it comes to cleaning that piece of equipment. And you might be thinking, well, Kramer, if I smell like campfire smoke, then it's going to be more immersive. It's going to be more realistic. And that's true. But what's also going to be more realistic is how I'm going to stand a little further back from you while we're talking to each other. So what you can do is you can take that garment that can't be put in the washing machine and put it into a plastic Ziploc bag or a trash bag if it's really that big. And then you put in baking soda and you let it just sit there overnight. The baking soda is going to help absorb a lot of that odor. And then you are going to have to deal with removing the baking soda from the garment. You can shake it around outside or beat it gently like you would a rug, but ultimately it's going to be safer than potentially shrinking or re-dyeing a garment after every single event that you go to. Another thing you can do, again with a Ziploc bag, is to take that garment and put it into the freezer and that is going to kill a lot of the odor causing bacteria. Just make sure that the garment isn't wet when you put it into the freezer and make sure that you do put it in a Ziploc bag so it doesn't stick to the inside of the freezer wall. There are also products such as Odoban, which is just a spray that you can put on your clothing and it's going to eliminate those odors. Probably a really good thing to have a small secret supply of when you're going to uh, LARPs or reenactment events just in case of emergencies. You will thank me and so will everybody else. Tip number seven is to wear two belts and more specifically that your kit belt should go on top of your daily belt. Your kit belt is going to have your sword and a lot of your pouches and various things that you don't necessarily need all the time. Things that you might want to take off quickly and easily. Your daily belt is going to have the things that you will use all of the time and it's going to mean that you can take one belt off without ruining your costume look and without having to take all of those pieces off the belt itself. Everything is just there, ready to go. In my experience, what I've discovered is that the kit belt should go above your daily belt. This is because the kit belt is actually holding a lot more weight. It's got your sword. It's got your pouches filled with gold. That needs to go above the daily belt so that it's resting not only on your hip bones, but also on that secondary belt. It's going to take some of the pressure off. It's going to help support a lot of that weight, and it's going to keep you more comfortable. The belt that goes on top is also 
also easier to take off. You're going to be taking off your kit belt more often than your daily belt. So the daily belt should go on first at the beginning of the day, and then the kit belt goes on top of that and above it. Tip number eight is to choose what I call projects from necessity. You know how I always say that we should be doing experiments with what we already have to gather data on how things function? Well, this is why we choose projects from necessity. I need this piece of kit for this reason. It fulfills this function. That is why I have it or need to make it or purchase it, whatever. For example, we have this glove. When I was practicing with this long sword, because uh, I think it looks aesthetically better for my ranger character, I discovered um, that long term, the cross guard on this is actually so wide that it rubs up against my first thumb knuckle here, and it was actually causing it to uh, um, bleed, even when I was wearing my green knitted fingerless gloves. I got a lot of compliments on those, but they didn't protect me from my own weapon. I wasn't able to use it for multiple hours at a time. Not good. So I decided it was time to upgrade it to a new piece. I knew I wanted it to be fingerless so I could still have that tactile feel, and I knew I wanted it to be leather and cover this portion of my thumb because that is the entire point. It's what's going to protect me. So I did a little looking around and I took inspiration from Aragorn's leather fingerless glove from the Lord of the Rings. Ultimately, I decided to make my own leather glove from scraps left over from when I made my boots, following tip number five. Um, instead of either purchasing ready-made fingerless leather gloves or buying leather gloves and then cutting the fingers off. So this glove is a project from necessity. I'm wearing it because it protects me. And if I don't, my hands will actually bleed. I am not wearing it because I think it looks cool or because a character that I idolize has one, I am wearing it because I need to. And I only have one because I didn't have enough scraps to make one for my left hand, and because when I'm wielding this sword, my right hand is the only one that's in danger, so there's no reason to make a second one. And it is these functional elements, these projects from necessity that are going to give you a very unique look. People might not know why it is that I'm wearing this, but there is a reason behind it, and that reason makes things simpler for you because now you don't have to make up a design that looks interesting. You can just do a little bit of experimentation, and then you'll you'll naturally come up with something that looks unique based on what needs you actually have. Tip number nine is a little cerebral, but it's going to help you if you are designing or purchasing elements for your garb, uh, and you wanna make sure that things are believable. And that is to understand the difference between historical accuracy and authenticity. Authenticity is defined as being something that is genuine or true to the original. So if we're doing historical reenactment, then historical accuracy is what is authentic. But if we're talking about LARP or we're talking about fantasy reenactment, Lord of the Rings reenactments, oftentimes there isn't an original because the secrets of the elves have been lost to time. So what does authenticity mean then? Authenticity would be if we can logically prove that something could have existed and why it would have existed. If we can prove those things, then it's not historically accurate, but it is historically plausible. And that is what makes something believable. That is what makes something authentic. So this glove is also a great example for that because it looks like a patchwork glove. I didn't design it that way. I said I made it from scraps. It actually is a patchwork glove. It wasn't mass produced. You know, there aren't a dozen other gloves that look exactly like this because it was cut from a pattern. It looks like I could have cut it and stitched it together while sitting on my floor because that's exactly what I did. There will never be another glove that looks like this one. Now, did they make fingerless leather gloves like this historically in the medieval period? No, I haven't seen any evidence that they did that. But could they have made them? Yes, absolutely, they could. So in my book, that makes this glove authentic. It's not historically accurate, but it is believable for a fantasy character. And tip number 10 is potentially a little anticlimactic, but it is no less important, and that is to always, always carry a small linen or cotton cloth. Highly versatile, you can use it to hold things, you can use it to strain water or prepare various foods, but the most important thing that you can do with it is you can put it in cool water, get it nice and soaking wet, and then wrap it around your neck on hot summer days, and that is going to keep you cool. And summer is going to come a lot more quickly than I think it is, so that's why that is going in this video. Thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. Again, a super huge thank you goes to all of the 500, might even be 600 plus people now that have already joined my Discord community.
community. I could not be happier or more proud. I'm, I'm having trouble keeping up with all of the conversations because there are so many. Everyone is so passionate. It's just really, really cool. You are awesome. And the biggest of thank yous goes to all of my Patreon supporters whose names are appearing on the screen right now. There are more, but these are my Knights of the Realm, my Rangers, my heroes, and my legendary heroes. It has been awesome to get to know you and talk to you. I am so excited for this year. Thank you so much. I will talk to you all soon. And in the meantime, I'd like to wish you good luck on your adventures.